I spend some of my day or not always, but you know, I dream. And I used to think, uh, you know, you're, you're not working hard enough, you know, get back to work, do something. But over time, you realize that those moments that you're kind of got your chair back and you're staring out the window are the reasons you're still alive as a photographer. If you lead an interesting life, good pictures will happen. Oh, nice. You might well be my sexiest sounding guest. Go somewhere you've never been before and take a camera. We had this gorgeous Mediterranean light just flowing in. Which jazz do we win? A dark food. Very nice. Your first 10,000 pictures are your worst. Let's sit down, let's have a cup of tea. Welcome to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to this week's episode, episode 22 of the Standout Photography Show with me, Matthew Walker, where as always it is my honour and privilege to sit down with some of the finest working photographers in the world to unpack their systems, workflows and find out what enables them to perform consistently at the very top of their profession and of course pass on the very same principles for you to test and apply to your own photography. Before I introduce our guest today, is there someone that you would like to hear in conversation on the Standout Photography Show? If so, do let me know over on the Twittergrams at Matthew D. A. Walker. That is at Matthew D. A. Walker. And it is in no small part thanks to David Morrison on Twitter that I was able to secure today's guest. So, without further ado, please allow me to introduce a titan of photography, none other than Mr. Joe McNally. That is at Joe McNally Photo on Instagram and Twitter and joemcnally.com on the World Wide Webs. Joe is an internationally acclaimed, award-winning photographer whose prolific career includes assignments in nearly 70 countries. Joe is known worldwide as not only one of the top technically excellent photographers of his generation, but his charming demeanour, confidence and humour, which you will hear in abundance throughout the episode, make him a sought-after choice for CEOs to celebrities to commercial and magazine clients alike. He is among the rare breed of photographers who have bridged the world between photojournalism and advertising, amassing an impressive commercial and advertising client list including FedEx, Sony, ESPN, Adidas, Land's End, Epson, the list goes on. He has shot numerous cover stories and highly complex features for National Geographic, Life and Sports Illustrated, where his research skills and unmatched preparedness are highly valued. Joe has been named one of the top five most socially influential photographers by iFi, with a combined social media following of close to, wait for it, one million to date. And his popularity continues to grow as he pursues directing a variety of film projects. As I mentioned at the beginning, Joe is a true titan of photography and like many of my great guests, and I like Joe and Tom Stoddart, don't use the word great lightly, agreed without hesitation to speak with me for the show, which I am extremely grateful. Throughout our conversation, we discuss finding motivation and creativity by doubling down and digging deep mental clarity through early mornings, storytelling through photography, deflecting ego, striving for, as we said, great images, shaping your photography through photojournalism, going the extra mile to learn as a student, a thoroughly interesting glimpse into Joe's mindset. Embracing change, self-publishing, directing large-scale commercial shoots, hiring and trusting good people, listening on set, and of course, why calzones are cheap but filling in New York City. So, without further ado, please switch off from the world and enjoy my conversation with none other than Joe McNally. 
Joe McNally. It's and it really is an enormous pleasure to say welcome to the Standout Photography Show, Joe. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Matthew. Absolute pleasure, Joe. First of all, where in the world are we speaking to you today? I'm in I'm at home, which you know uh, is kind of where we all are, I guess, or lots of us. Uh, yeah, it's Ridgefield, Connecticut. It's a it's a small town north of New York City. I, if I get on the road and head south, I can be in New York in about an hour and 15 minutes or so. So it's not too far from the airports and all of that, but we're a little bit out in the country. I'm pleased you mentioned that you are at home because I wanted to start with a quote, but actually, before we get to that, uh, would you mind describing your setup? One of the things that has kind of come from this podcast, which I didn't necessarily uh, mean to, is that some people, including you, have incredible home setups. And I know you've been recently working on yours. Would you mind describing what yours looks like? What environment are you in right now? Sure. I'm in the workroom, what we call the workroom at uh, our studio slash home. And, you know, there's four workstations here. And this is kind of, you know, if we have a client meeting or something like that and they come up, which doesn't happen all that often, you know, oftentimes the reverse is true. I'm going into the city. Uh, but when we do have meetings here, it's it's a nice place to walk into because, you know, various uh, kinds of, you know, trappings of the career are hanging on the wall. And we have... Um, you know, as I say, four workstations, but my particular workstation early in the pandemic, I started to really teach a lot on Zoom or, or converse on Zoom. So I really turned my own personal workstation into a little bit of a broadcast booth, which is, you know, a little grand sounding. It's not really, but it's, you know, I put up a, a Manfrotto LED light, you know, and I have a little diffuser. It's called a halo right over me. And uh, for our transmissions, we use a, a nice Icon Z6 and a, a 24 millimeter lens to to uh, get a good you know high res you know rendition. Uh, even though you know I have the kind of face that would you know probably prefer low res, <laughs> but um, you know and uh, we got a you know a, a good audio setup. Uh, it's a it's a you know a Blue Yeti, which is I guess kind of standard. And we just tried to kind of clean the space up and make it presentable basically because the whole world has been online uh of late i'm pleased you mentioned that you the changes that you've made because it's one of the things i do want to come on to discuss with you is that throughout your career you're not afraid or from the outside looking in seemingly you're not afraid to adapt and move forward and progress but we'll come on to that a little bit later on because i wanted to Start with a quote, if I may, which I read on famousphotographers.net. And it's something that you said, which is, it's like walking on a tightrope when one is a photographer. Sometimes you need to thrust yourself to perform and get to work. And at other times, the trepidation of failure can be a powerful motivator. It is then crucial to somehow find your motivation and keep on going, even if your creativity is lost for a while. And I think... I read it and I think it will resonate with so many creatives, not just photographers. And I guess my question was that it's a very hard thing to do to motivate yourself when you have lost uh, a spark of creativity, we could say. What techniques have you developed over the years that enable you to find that motivation? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, peaks and valleys, right? That's the story of a photographic career mm. and probably more valleys than peaks, to be quite honest. Um, you know, there's a lot of setbacks that one encounters as a photographer and they can be uh, creative setbacks. They can be financial. They can be, um, you know, a loss of a client, uh, you know, difficulties in terms of, you know, professional relationships, all that sort of stuff. I mean, we all know that and it's out there for us. So the tightrope kind of mentality I've got about it is how do you negotiate this? How do you keep balanced and also keep creating? So my solution, which is, you know, again, probably too much to allow it. It's a, it's a personal kind of mechanism, I guess, that I use to kind of get through it is, uh, is very simple. And, um, I, I just, I keep my head down and I keep working. 
I don't, uh, I'm not the kind of photographer who's like, I need a break. I'm going to take six months off, uh, and seek new horizons. Uh, I'm going to, uh, just lay back or something like that, or, um, going to re up my portfolio and put new pictures in. I mean, though, that's a, you know, a constant thing that you, that you do need to do uh, on an ongoing basis, but I don't have sort of a magic bullet kind of thing. I, I, I keep my head down. Um, and I keep working. I've always felt that whenever things are at their worst, that's when you have to take your, your greatest risks. You, you can't back off, you know, when things are not going well financially or, or creatively, you just have to keep going. And even if it means spending some of your own money to generate an assignment, stay behind the camera keep working at it, you will break through. The The key, I think, is oftentimes can be as simple as a good photograph. You know, you can be just have a dry well that you're confronting for a period of time and then all of a sudden turn a corner and there's beautiful light and children playing in the street and where something happens or an assignment occurs where you just feel like, ah, oh, okay, now I remember why I was here. So it's, if you're struggling with that creativity, it's it's digging deep and knuckling down for you rather than, as you said, taking a break and finding your creativity, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people have success at that, you know, that's sort of like, I'm going to, you know, just back off or, uh, you know, do something else for a while or whatever it might be, whatever their solution is perfect for them. That's never worked for me. I, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I'm not at a point where I'm going to go off and try to find myself. Um, I, I kind of, I am who I am at this point. I'm a photographer and, you know, through better or worse, I keep being a photographer. On that note, actually, when we spoke on email the other day before our conversation, you mentioned that you were an early riser. I'm an early riser. And I spoke to a wonderful photojournalist called Simon Norfolk uh, yesterday, and he too is an early riser. And it got me thinking, what does that offer you personally? And what does an early start offer your work? The early start for me is, is uh, very practical. It's really the only clear mental space I have during the course of a day. Uh, I'm much better at 5 a.m. than I am at 10 p.m. Uh, that's my body clock there. I just, I can't, you know, avoid it. That's what it is. But there's also a quietude in the morning. Uh, the sun is coming up. The, the light is getting brighter in the windows. And you might be, for instance, all by yourself. You know, your, your spouse maybe is still asleep or, um, uh, you know, you're in a, you're in a hotel room on assignment and you're about to confront the world with a camera or a crew or a production and things are about to get really kind of crazy. So that morning solitude, I really value. Why photography? And I, I've asked this question a lot during these conversations. And at first I started to almost apologize for it because it felt ambiguous. But then I, I listened to a, a TED talk by Simon Sinek author of Start With Why. And there was just a sudden clarity, of course, because unless you have the why, then you are, there's no focus. So why photography for you? Good question. Uh, and it, you know, forces you to double down and really, really think, you know, in reaction to it, uh, you know, cause that's not a, a typical thing. You know, mo a lot of folks, well, how did you get started? Why do you like this, etc. Um, the why of, of doing this for me is I think intrinsic to who I am. It's, uh, I've said this a number of times, especially when I teach young photographers or at a university level or something like that. Being a photographer is not something you do. Being a photographer is something you are. So it is part of your fiber, part of your being, um, a need to communicate, a need to visually explain the world around you. I photograph because I want to understand. I photograph because I'm curious. Uh, I, I have always had a great reference for stories. I grew up on stories, all manner of stories, adventure tales and Jack London and, and, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings and, and fantasies and epics and, you know, boyhood stuff you could say, you know, um, and 
I found that stories form the basis for my imagination. And my imagination is what has sustained me for all these years as a photographer. You know, if I can dream it, maybe I can shoot it. And that's a, a big motivator and really the reason I keep doing this. And, you know, it's a, it's a way of, you know, if your imagination, if you view your imagination as a pressure cooker, you know, and that you just keep building up steam, you know, and you're thinking of stuff. The photography is like the safety valve. It's the release. It's how you express those those thoughts that are rummaging around in your head. I love the safety valve and that uh, analogy. That is, yeah, it certainly gives it a, a clarity. On that note, actually, and you've kind of answered some of this, but again, when I was doing my homework, American Photo describe you as and I completely agree with this, one of the most important people in photography. I should say one of the hundred most important people in photography. Perhaps the most versatile photojournalist working today, Photo District News, describe you as one of the 30 most influential photographers of the decade. But that got me thinking, how do you describe, because that's other people describing you and your work for you, which is a wonderful position to be in, but how do you personally describe you and your work as a photographer yes again you know good question uh, there is a lot of uh, chatter and it's it's all you know thankfully it, you know it's it, some of the things that have been directed my way are very amiable and, and very um, uh, kind-hearted and laudatory that's that's wonderful I, I uh, you know, I'm I'm always very thankful for that. If if there has been a positive reaction to anything I've done photographically, I'm grateful for that, to be sure. But I also try to deflect it. Uh, I think um, the idea of uh, being a photographer should necessarily be apart from the uh, I don't know the 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 ego of it. I guess, or the, the accolades that one might accumulate, you have to keep those in a lockbox off to the side because it's just, it's, it's really just clutter, um, for you at the camera. You have to kind of just stay true to yourself and realize I'm a photographer. I'm going to fail more often than I'll succeed. That is a truism for any photographer. And for me personally, it keeps my feet on the ground and it keeps me wondering, how can I turn the next corner? How can I make a better photograph? You know, you, you this is an odd field in a certain way. Um, perhaps, I don't, I don't know, creative endeavors never have a real end to them. But I oftentimes liken the idea of being a photographer to Sisyphus. We keep pushing the rock up the hill, but we will never, ever really get it to the top. Hmm. You know, our best picture will never be taken because hopefully if you're still involved and engaged in this, your best picture is still out there somewhere. And that is fuel for the fire. The more you kind of sit back and say, oh, look at my portfolio and start to rest on your on your uh, accolades. I think the lazier you'll get and the less driven and the less effective. So it's, it's wonderful to uh, have uh, create have have created uh, a body of work that that at least some folks have recognized over time but uh in terms of being a photographer the the next assignment is always the litmus test <laughs> you know there might be some folks out there who think you're terrific but then you've got another client and another day and another job and you have to prove it all over again i enjoyed that you said and again because this will resonate with so many creatives not just photographers that you fail more than you succeed you're obviously not afraid of failing but are you someone that will take the positives from failure absolutely absolutely i mean you know you don't like to screw up you, you never intend to do that mm. you don't you don't like to look at a take in the aftermath and say wow i just didn't close the door on this one uh, but that is going to happen. Creative endeavor is always risky. And the emotions that you put into play, the amount of uh, personal involvement that you put on the table as a photographer is inherently risky. You know, it's not a mathematical formula. You know, in photography, one plus one does not equal two. Hmm. You can do everything right. You can have good light. Uh, a good subject, a good environment, a nice camera. Everything about your pictures can be technically accurate. 
and you come back to the studio and put them up on the screen and realize they suck. Um, so why is that? There's an alchemy that occurs when a photographer's eye is in the camera and things are moving and wonderful stuff is happening in front of the lens or truisms are occurring, true, you know, kind of uh, expressions, uh, true reactions from your subject, etc. That connects sometimes, it's, you know, not sometimes, when it does happen, it's very powerful. But it is uh, occasional, you know, great pictures. Whew, man, those are tough to find. You know, we hopefully do good pictures on a regular basis. We survive. We we hand things in to a client that uh, pleases the client. It keeps us going, enables us to keep the lights on, all of that. But those truly profound moments of the camera, what we all strive for, those are occasional uh, uh, occurrences. They're, they're, they're nice. Thing. It's interesting that you say that great images are few and far between because I spoke with, as you know, uh, Tom Stoddart, who we both spoke about before we went live. And he said the same thing. He said, throughout my career, I've taken maybe five or six images that I consider great images. And Tom's career spans 50 years. On that note, actually, you, to just journey back, you began as a youngster training as a journalist. And that's what Tom also wanted to do. And he realized when he arrived that actually it wasn't the journalist or the journalism that he was interested in. It was the photo journalism. What was it about photography that steered you away from traditional journalism? Sure. Um, and first of all, I love the fact that Tom said that he's, he's such an amazing photographer. He is. Yes. And, and uh, the fact that he sort of is honest about that owns up to it. I'm in the same boat, you know, just, just as an aside, I, I, I had, I, I've listened to photographers and I've seen them write about stuff where they'll say things like, you know, I think this picture is one of my most iconic and I'm like, wait a minute, let's get everybody out of the pool here. Um, you know, iconic pictures, great pictures. Those are few and far between. They really are. And I'm in the same boat with Tom. I mean, I've been at this for 40 years and like really terrific moments, memorable stuff. Well, you know, that's a handful. That's really just a handful of images mm. after all of this time. But um, to reference the beginnings, yes, I was in school to be trained as a journalist and I wanted to be a writer. I was kind of a wannabe athlete as a, a you know, younger guy, and, and, but I didn't have the skills to you know, become a professional athlete, even play at a college level. I just enjoyed sports. And I thought, well, maybe I could be a sports writer. That way I could stay connected to a world I'm really familiar with and I really like. And that would be a good way to observe and report on the sporting world. I thought hmm, that would be an interesting objective. And I wrote for my high school newspaper, et cetera, and my college newspaper. Uh, but in the course of that writing curriculum, I was literally required, forced to take a photography class. And I borrowed my dad's old vacation camera. And as soon as I took that camera in my hands, I knew, you know, it just felt completely comfortable. And I started thinking about that and how... I could tell stories with pictures instead of being at a typewriter. I could be in the world out in the field. That's the beautiful thing about being a photographer. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not a robotic assembly line process. It's, it's fraught with uncertainty and all of that. But the wonderful thing about that uncertainty is you encounter it out there. You have to go outside. You have to take a walk. You have to go somewhere. Um, it's fuel for your curiosity about seeing areas of the world that you've never seen, et cetera. So that I really embrace about being a photographer. And when I realized that early in school, I was like, yeah, I have to take a hard right turn here. Do you think even taking that hard right turn, as you put it, though, has because there's there's obviously something ingrained in you that there's a, a spark of the journalist do you think that initial curiosity has shaped you as a photographer absolutely um again i, I kind of grew up on stories and there was a legendary sports writer actually paul gallico he's not all that well known anymore he was pretty well known back in the day and 
he uh, he used to write about his experiences from real experience. So as a sports writer, he lobbied to get in the ring with Jack Dempsey. I don't know if you remember that name, but Jack Dempsey was a, a, a boxing champion. He was known as the Manasseh Mauler. And Gallico wanted to tell the story of what it was really like to be in the ring with Jack Dempsey. And, of course, you know, it took Dempsey about... 30 or 40 seconds to knock Gallico out, you know, <laughs> and uh, he woke up on the canvas and his head was splitting, but it informed his writing, you know, it made the experience real for his readers. And that's what we have to do as journalists, as photojournalists, is we have to bring that back to our readers. The readers are our ultimate client. You know, sure, you're working for a magazine or an ad editor or something like that, but ultimately who consumes your picture, the, the viewer, uh, the, the, the participant out there. And so you have to excite, engage, delight, uh, madden, um, make curious, uh, infuriate, you know, uh, I mean, all those things are, are what we do when we bring back pictures, we engage. So that's a really powerful thing. And, and being a photographer requires you to be in the middle of things. You can't report from afar with a camera. Out of interest, having made that decision to not explore the route of a journalist, and you said you took a hard right turn, what practical steps did you take to begin your career as a photographer? Probably the most practical was to realize immediately I was woefully unprepared, um, having taken an initial course. So I applied uh, at my school to be allowed to take additional photography classes, which were generally reserved for photo majors, not writing majors. But mm. I petitioned and they let me in to a couple more classes. I graduated. And then I stayed in school and I did a master's degree in photojournalism because, again, even when I graduated, I had a couple of classes under my belt. I knew I said, I, I don't know enough. I can't go someplace and get a job with the skills that I have. So I, I decided to, to stay in school. I got uh, a couple of teaching assistantships, which was a way of paying for my graduate education. And I thought, well, this is a good deal. I'll stay in school for a little while and I'll let myself marinate a little bit more because I am not ready. Uh, and then I spent those couple of years, acquired a few more skills and went to New York City. A strange question, perhaps, but how do you like to learn? Is it because and I ask this, for example, I I am much better on the job, watching people, speaking to people like yourself, like Tom Stoddart, and learning on the job versus being taught. For some reason, it just sits better with me and it, uh, I'm able to absorb it better. How do you like to learn? And I guess, are you still learning? Oh, boy, yeah. Yeah, that is, uh, photography is nonstop education, you know, whenever you take that camera in your hand. Because, you know, with all the experience that I've had, and it's considerable. I still make mistakes. I still backfire. I'm still learning stuff on location. Things will go in unexpected directions. And you have to roll with that punch. And the experience, of course, gives you that kind of cushion that you can fall back on and say, okay, how do I deal with this and make hopefully good informed decisions about the next step. But I am an uh, um on site, as you indicate that you are, Matthew, uh, I, I, you know, need to be there. I need to be engaged. Uh, I, I am not a great um, book learner. I'm really just not. My my career in school was middling at best. I wasn't a, a completely stellar student. That's for sure. I did okay. That's the best I can say about it. Mm. Uh, but when I grappled with something that really, really meant something to me, the camera gave me something physical to engage in. It put me in places where I could observe and learn. I, uh, I was able to introduce myself to photographers I admired. One of the things I highly recommend for anyone who might be interested in the field or might be listening to this is to dive into the history of this field. Identify photographers who have gone before, who have done great work. See what that great work is all about and see what kind of pictures actually really provoke emotions within you. And there's a path there for sure, a path to learn and also a path that you might choose to follow or emulate if someone's re pictures really resonate with you. I'm, I'm pleased you said that because it's, 
it, it's one of the main reasons for starting this podcast is exactly that to speak to people like you who I admire and many other photographers admire and find out why what is it about the person behind these images that makes them so uh, special to look at on you you mentioned that you having left school you went to New York what were some of the what were some of the best lessons you learnt in those early years because they're crucial I mean they're absolutely crucial for the foundations of a career what are the best lessons that you took from those years oh you know certain practical things like calzones are really cheap but filling when you're <laughs> not making any money <laughs> um you know the the 104 bus from the new york daily news back to my apartment on the upper west side after 11 o'clock went to a quarter half price um those kinds of <laughs> survival <laughs> things that you learn when you uh, first arrive in in some place and nobody is hiring you um but uh yeah the New York is a is a harsh uh, taskmaster, to be sure. It's a, a city filled with creative, energetic people who are very successful. And I went there thinking, like, well, I'll just take a crack at this, you know. And it certainly was not impressed with me <laughs> on any level. And, you know, I guess maybe what reinforced uh, certain lessons that I maybe didn't grapple with right then and there, but uh, intuitively I incorporated and realize now are, are quite powerful is that, you know, good things take time, you know, uh, to get good at something it takes practice and success is not immediate. So it, it took, you know, three plus more years of grinding away in New York, really essentially not being a photographer. I was, I had a job at the New York Daily News first as a copy boy and then as a studio apprentice. Neither of them were photography jobs. So I would literally do photography whenever I could on my weekends, my lunch hours and this and that. I would ride with photographers uh, at the paper and try to observe what they were doing and how they would cover a job. I would angle as a copy boy to get photo related tasks like going to Yankee stadium and picking up the photographer's film, coming back on the subway with it uh, would mean that I would be able to go to Yankee stadium, go down to the photographer's positions and, and really kind of learn, you know, and, uh, you know, see how they covered things, what lenses were they using, what, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it, it you know, it became immediately apparent to me that photography is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So um, I'm still running it. Hmm. That is a lovely, lovely way to think of it. I couldn't agree more. I also read in an interview that you said it's a very uncertain industry, and of course it is. Any creative pursuit is. Will you set goals for yourself in order to give some structure to that uncertainty? Interesting, um, you know, uh, question to be sure. Um, and it forces me to think. I, 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 I've had goals, you know, my, my overarching goal when I came to, to New York or when I started a career was like, you know, two main things. I would, I'd like to do good work, I thought to myself, and I'd like to have the respect of my peers. And, you know, that was just kind of a, you know, very broad based, you know, nothing specific like, oh, I want to be shooting for Vogue magazine by the time I'm 28. I, I've never had those kinds of goals. It might sound mildly idiotic, but I've made an entire career out of doing whatever the next best thing seemed to be presented. Uh, you know, I've, I was fortunate in many ways that certain work led to other work and uh, certain assignments were became expansive and I came to the attention of other editors and it was a bit of a knock-on effect you know that one magazine would use you and then a fairly small community back then really I mean that would get noticed if you had a cover of Sports Illustrated or Life or something like that people would notice so uh, that was a um, you know a not really a plan. I couldn't, uh, that would be too much to say about it. You know, um, I wanted to do good work and I was willing to do whatever I needed to do to pursue an outlet or outlets that would allow me to do good work. But I didn't have like a, a specific like goal per se. Like I, I really want to shoot, you know, the Rolex campaign or, or gear myself in that direction. Uh, it might have been interesting to have had such a plan, but I didn't. Just to 
segue slightly. You, you mentioned then about the the Rolex campaign, and obviously you've you've shot an awful lot for National Geographic and many other wonderful clients. When I was doing my homework, I was looking at your website, and it's very clean and clear, and you don't display a lot of images. There's no clutter, and that got me thinking. You've clearly got a, a vast body of wonderful work behind you. How do you whittle that down to the images that you display as your shop window, so to speak? Yeah. Um, well, you, you know, there's a certain consensus, I guess, that gets achieved when you're a publications photographer. The uh, the selects that a magazine would emphasize or choose to publish, you know, when you work for good editors, which, you know, uh, I did at National Geographic and you'd go through a take, you would really boil it down to the essence or the, the bottom line, good pictures and display those. And those just sort of de facto become, you know, as you say, your shop window, uh, that's, you know, that's a consensus that these pictures really work. Um, and then of course you have another layer as all, all photographers do your own, perhaps personal favorite pictures or pictures that no one else seems to pay attention to, but you find a certain measure of satisfaction in them. Hmm. And so there's a bit of a mix there uh, for me in terms of pictures that have been used and published and accepted as uh, being effective. And then there's also things that literally very few people, if anybody has ever really noticed that I just personally enjoy, which is a little bit of a segue here is one of the reasons I enjoy social media uh, to a degree. You know, I participate in it. I have a blog, etc. Because, you know, having a blog or a Instagram account gives you an opportunity to self-publish. And you can put out some of that stuff that magazines or clients have bypassed. And say, yeah, yeah what do you guys think? That's kind of a, a cool thing that we can do now that's been enabled by technology. I'm pleased you mentioned the blog, actually, because it was something that I wanted to come on and discuss. But while we're here, we might as well look at it. Because, again, when I was doing my homework, you you shot the first ever full digital story for National Geographic. And I guess throughout the time of your career, the landscape of photography has changed so much. Film to digital, the rise of social media, as you just said then. And you are not afraid of change and you embrace it head on. I mean, Instagram, you've got 235,000 followers, YouTube, uh, 56.6. Has not being afraid to adapt or perhaps the fear of not adapting helped shape your career? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good thing to bring up. Um, you know, the... In an odd way, even though the publications are gone uh, that I grew up with, I'm probably having more fun as a photographer now than I think I ever have in the sense that there is this fuel of social media and engagement and uh, the photographic community is, is uh, you know, very, I don't know, we, we engage, we, we stick, stick with each other and the social media aspects of that and the connectivity of digital enables that. And I enjoy being a member of the photographic community. I've always enjoyed the company of photographers and listening to people and how they approach work and what they do and, and looking at their photographs. I have a big library of books, you know, that uh, I've accumulated over the years and I just enjoy reflecting, you know, on other photographers work. So, that's that's a, a, a cool thing that has changed and I'm unafraid of. Um, and also there's the, the actual practical considerations. Matthew, I want to stay in business. I want to keep doing this. And if you just continue to do that, which you have already always done, you will be out of business. Um, sadly, I know some very talented people who just, you know, by decision or non-decision, they just didn't adapt. And uh, they, um, I, I miss that. I miss uh, their input because they're not uh, as active as they once were. And they're very, very talented. And so 
I looked at, you know, the longevity that I wanted to have for a career that I sort of need to have, you know, financially to be sure I have to keep working all of that. So it's kind of like, yeah, adapt or die, you know, is a, is, you know, kind of the, the, you know, word on the street, you know, you, you can't stay static as a photographer. Again, I'm pleased you mentioned the business side of photography because I think it's it's one of those areas that a lot of artists maybe struggle with is the business side of photography or certainly in conversations I've had with people. And I spoke with Art Wolf and and he was very modest and he said, look, I'm, I'm not a good businessman. He said, I'm just prolific and I work extremely hard. And I wondered whether for you would you consider yourself do you have a good business brain or is it similar to art where you just work so incredibly hard and the business almost takes care of itself i'd, I'd probably be in an arts camp um you know uh, i've i've been you know as they say old expression i've been broker than a church mouse um <laughs> on occasion and the uh, the only thing i've been able to or the reason I might have been able to recover from those really, really um, uh, kind of desperate periods was just to continue to work as hard as I possibly could and take whatever jobs I could and just stay behind the camera and push and push and push. And, uh, you know, you if you can do that, you will recover, you know, because, um, again, I, I think I mentioned earlier, every every photographer has peaks and valleys and they can be emotional, creative, financial, physical, all those things, uh, are, are a mix in this industry. So I, I am blessed with the fact that, um, I've had a long time studio manager. She's been with me for 28 years and she's an amazing producer and, and effectively business manager. So she keeps the business running, uh, while I'm kind of out doing whatever. Um, so and we're a good combination on that level because she's very practically minded, whereas I am much less so. So that is a, a good teamwork aspect of our studio. And my wife, Annie, also works at the studio now. She she had been a Nikon tech rep for 12 years, and then she went and she created the professional division at Adorama Camera here in the United States, which is a huge camera store. So she's very familiar with the business, and she handles a lot of our social media and marketing and workshops and that end of things. So um, I'm not laying claim to any particular genius here. Um, the fact that we have a good team at the studio is, is one of the reasons we've kind of managed to stay the course. I guess that's the classic uh, scenario of surrounding yourself with good people. Absolutely. People who are strong at what you might not be strong at. You know, um, you know, I, I spend some of my day or not always, but, you know, I dream. And, you know, I used to think, uh, you know, you're you're not working hard enough. You know, get back to work, do something. But over time, you realize that those moments that you're kind of got your chair back, you know, and you're staring out the window are the reasons you're still alive as a photographer. You know, that's where ideas come from. And then you've got people around you who can take those ideas, hopefully, and massage them into something that uh, is doable, is real. So it is very much a, a teamwork effort. We have a huge production we're doing on Monday. And Lynn has been producing that now. She's worked pretty much nonstop on this shot for three weeks, you know. And I, I, I always, I always say about these big productions, the, the role of the producer and the role of the photographer can be correlated, you know, this way. It's the, uh, the producer signs on for a long, drawn-out torture. The photographer signs up for a short, brisk whipping. You know, um, so the, the length of production time gets to the point where that Lynn on the day of the shoot just hands it over to me and says, okay, you're set to go. And then I handle it from there. So it's, a, it's a good, um, you know, uh, patchwork quilt of, of skills that, that keeps us alive. I'm pleased you mentioned large production, uh, large commercial shoots, because it is something that I wanted to explore with you in for a number of reasons, I guess. One of which was that as a photographer on these shoots, if you have a team with you, what do you like to delegate and what do you 
like to have full control over. And I, I don't necessarily mean full control over because you don't trust the people that you are delegating to, but more that what do you personally like to have control over and what do you, what is useful for you to delegate to others? Sure. Um, you know, I have the idea for the shot in my head and I direct the action from that, you know, place. And so I have the look of the shot, the lighting for the shot, uh, the staging. Uh, I'm responsible for the relationship of the uh, subjects with me at camera. Uh, I don't allow that to be interfered with at all. I'm very sacrosanct about it. And so that is, is my bailiwick. You know, the look, the feel, the light, the staging, the relationship, the emotion, all of that. Um, and that's a, that's a tall order on, on a, on a shoot day when you're, you've kind of got the equivalent of a three ring circus running around you. So my crew chief for first assistant, I delegate the gear, you know, and responsibility to direct the crew effectively. And I'll, I'll give, you know, lighting instructions and then they will physically wrangle the gear. Um, uh, you know, my producer Lynn will form a buffer around the camera. And she'll handle all the logistics from the catering to the insurance to the permits to the to the releases, et cetera. And I rely on her to sort of keep uh, keep me at camera sort of as an island, you know, so that I can concentrate on the shot. So those kinds of things I, I delegate to be sure, because the crucial element for me is what I'm seeing through the lens and whatever has to be applied there, whether it's the emotion of the scene, the lighting of the scene, the staging, the composition, that is, um, those are elements that are under my control and need to be under my control. Everything else, if you have a crew that's really capable and, and I'm blessed by having that, you know, on a consistent basis, I, I'm a big believer in hiring good people and letting them do what they, what they do, like hair, makeup and styling, you know, I'm not a makeup expert. Uh, I, I give the idea of the general look of the picture and then I let the makeup person do what they're going to do because they can do it far better and they're creative in their own right. So I, I also listen, um, and this is a, I think a, an important point maybe to, to make, I listen to people on the set. Um, I'll call people over to the camera. I'll solicit, a, a thought or an opinion um, the crew chief, uh, that I have, have had for 10 years, he's, he's gone now. He moved down to Virginia, but you know, he would, would be with me on the set and we would talk about the look of the shot. So I'm not so, um, autocratic, you know, or, um, driven by my own kind of firm convictions that I don't, uh, heed counsel and wisdom. Uh, I, I listen, my ears are always open on the set. Where does your, what, what does the journey look like from, for example, this shoot that you, the large one that you have coming up on Monday, what does the journey look like from the moment of inquiry for that shoot to settling on what will be the final image? And I asked because, again, when I spoke to Simon Norfolk yesterday, he said he finds his inspiration anywhere, anywhere other than photography. He said, I will not look at other photographers' work. I enjoy, I enjoy ballet, I enjoy paintings, and that's where I find my inspiration. What does it look like for you? Yeah, um... You know, I have ruminations, you know, I have um, thoughts and imaginations about pictures and they, where exactly they come from is, uh, I don't know, you know, it's, it's hard to say where all that stuff comes from. You are, a, you are a, a pastiche, you know, as a photographer, you know, all sorts of influences swirled together and uh, your upbringing, your, your outlook on life, your, the, what you read, what you see, um, what you've gravitated towards you know uh so yeah the the ideas for pictures kind of bubble up you know i mean i always uh, on a commercial job you have to take the considerations of the client into um the realm of you know the framework in which you're thinking but within that context or even outside of that context i just think freely and i'm i, I don't like to uh kind of um you know uh, dive into other photographers work as well. I, I find um, my own imagination to stem from, you know, comic books and, and the world of dance and 
uh, all sorts of things. I think I see light on the street and it makes me start to think. Um, I did a, a big production a few years ago. It was based almost entirely upon when I was scouting. I saw sunlight going up instead of down. And then I realized that there was sun outside of the window of this house that was bouncing off a pool. And the light was coming up instead of down. And I based really my whole lighting scenario on that and essentially recreated the reflecting board of a pool outside with flash and, sil and silver, uh, you know, um, draping. So, you know, it comes at you from all different directions. I think photographers have to be a, kind of a 360 compass. And you're always kind of scanning the horizon and seeing what might just jog your spirit into a creative place mm. so it's constantly being aware of surroundings and being curious i guess yeah i mean you know um to paraphrase you know the the movies or you know make the voices stop <laughs> <laughs> you know um they're always in your head uh, as a photographer right? you know that 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 muse or that creative place is always kind of bubbling and talking to you and there are times, as we talked of earlier, where it will go silent and you have to pump more, more fuel into that, you know, and, and find it again. Mm. So it's, again, an uncertain thing to do. What does your journey look like from, so let's say uh, you're on a commercial shoot. What does the journey look like for you from the moment you finish the shoot, you take the card out of the camera to delivering what will be your final image? What does that journey look like? Um, pretty practical and similar, I'm sure, to you know all photographers. Uh, we we download and back up multiple multiple places. You know we have a, a RAID system here at the studio that is duplicated uh, via another RAID that is also duplicated by periodic updates for an offsite RAID. Uh, so you know we we do. We, we are meticulous about that. You have to be because, again, there's money on the line. When a client has spent a fair chunk of change creating the opportunity, you have to be very careful with those images afterwards. So that's the first step. And then, um, you know, certain kinds of takes, you know, I, w I would uh, let um, uh, my crew chief sort of take a crack at, you know, if there were commercial takes that everything was very, very controlled and there aren't too many surprises and not a heck of a lot of emotions at play. Um, he would thin a take for me just, you know, technically and, and, you know, um, sharp, unsharp, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you come down to the core of what you want to drill through as the photographer, uh, larger takes that really kind of involve, you know, my thought process, I've been blessed to have some clients that have just said, here's some money. Um, this is where we'd like to go. But within the context of going there, you can do virtually anything you want. And I've had good reaction to proposals, uh, you know, that I've that I've done. Uh, you know, Nikon came to me a couple of years, two, three years ago when they launched the D850. And I was one of four photographers asked worldwide to create a look and I wrote some treatments, and it was the Nikon uh, creative uh, agency in Singapore that then liaisoned with a German ad agency. And so I wrote some treatments for this combination of folks, and they liked it. And it was entirely based, Matthew, on the fact that I've read too many James Bond novels. Um, and the scenario I created was um, an elegant lady uh, in a gown. Uh, escaping from the museum having made a gem heist but her trailing gown knocks over a statue as just as she's about to make it past the sleeping security guard and they said you can create that and i said i think so yeah i can and the next thing you know i'm in the museum of ethnography in budapest and i had to light the whole museum because we had a we had to work overnight i had cranes outside and uh, we used about probably about 40,000 watt seconds of light to light these cavernous hallways, stage the shot, um, create the shot, cast it, hair, makeup, styling, all that sort of stuff. Took about a week on location. And it was all because I wrote a paragraph that was completely based on, you know, <laughs> complete fantasy, you know. So 
I love the detail though and the layers within that story. And again, I, I watched uh, a film that you'd made in the laundromat of the oh. <laughs> the the dead ballerina and the detective. I love the 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 story element. And I guess speaking to you, it all now makes sense when you said you were young. That's how you 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 grew up on stories. And I loved that about your work and just hearing you talk about that. I, yeah, well, I moved around a lot when I was a kid. I went to five mm. different grammar schools. And so I had to kind of create my own fun because I was always the new kid. So I kind of dove into the realm of my imagination, I guess, a bit, you know, at an early age. So, yeah, evidence of it now. Good Lord, a ballerina in a, in a dryer in a laundromat. <laughs> if anyone's not seen the image or the film i will link to it in the show notes because it is it's well worth the watch i'll ask you a, a handful more questions and I, I will let you go and enjoy the rest of your day because i know you have a very big shoot coming up on monday that you need to prep for so if you could display one image on a billboard somewhere perhaps Times square or leicester square that represented what you stand for as a photographer and represented your work, what would it be? Hmm. Oh boy. Um, wonderful question makes you pause and think, you know, my, you know, I mean, you could, you could say, you know, I am very fond of, uh, emotionally bonded to, uh, my family pictures, you know, pictures mm -hmm. of my amazing wife, Annie, um, or my kids, you know, you could, you could easily gravitate towards that on an emotional level as a photographer. Uh, professionally speaking, you know, I think it would probably represent something that's important to me in a relationship. You know, um, I, I'm a big believer in, in maintaining relationships and friendships have sprung from a lot of scenarios, uh, that I've photographed over the course of time. So it would probably be one of, one of those images that, reflect like the longevity of a career and the fact that you know this has been a wonderful experience not just in making photographs but also making friendships uh you know uh, and also you know coupled with the fact that you in the context of all of that you're still continuing to tell good stories important stories you know i mean given the given the events of now uh, you know i would probably put up on that billboard my my pictures i made last summer of my friend george up on cooper island north of alaska i went back up there after 20 years i had been assigned by the new york times sunday magazine to photograph george who's a, a researcher um and he's been studying a bird colony on this small island for over 40 years and when i photographed him at first in 2001 he was standing on ice and then I went back up this past last summer and photographed him standing in the exact same place and it's all ocean. Um, wow. So very, very palpable, powerful kind of evidence of what's going on on our planet. Goodness me. So what was the time span? Sorry, what did you say between the first and the, the second image? Uh, 19 years. Um, when I went up to Cooper, just as a very quick background, George is actually an ornithologist. He mm. studies a bird colony up there. And that was his bailiwick was uh, Arctic birds. And uh, in the course of doing that study, he would repeatedly go back to the colony and live on Cooper Island, which is a completely deserted stretch of ice north of Barrow, Alaska, out in, out in the ocean. And, uh, you know... Uh, he realized over the course of time that the colony was changing and the island was changing. And he's a, he's a note taker. He's old school. So his notebooks, 45 years of notebooks, are one of, if not the largest repository of experiential knowledge of global warming on the planet because he has watched the colony diminish and the ice go away. And so when I went up there, there was a cover story for the New York Times Sunday Magazine and the the cover slug on it or the the t story title was watching the earth melt away and i photographed george with uh, his bird scope standing on ice and he always said you know you come back up where i was standing it's all water and i thought it was a powerful thing to do so i got some funding and i took up a video crew um and directed a, a video called watching the earth melt away and now that ice that george was standing on is 300 miles out to sea and he's up to his hips in water in the exact same place. And that's 19 years. 
So there is a significant uh, event going on on our planet. I think that is the perfect way to conclude our conversation. Joe McNally, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Well, thank you, Matthew, and thank you for all the research that you did and a wonderful set of questions. I appreciate it very much. It's the very least I can do if you are going to give me some of your time. If people want to, and if if they Google your name, there is a million and one places they can find you, but where would you personally send people if they want to find out more about you and your work? Well, our our Instagram account is a is a very you know viable ongoing thing that we that we post on regularly and we communicate on, to be sure. And also, um, my website and my blog, Joe McNally, you know, dot com and backslash blog. And on Instagram, we're at uh, Joe McNally Photo is our handle. The the blog, I would second. It is a wonderful blog which I've enjoyed for a long time, and it's a, a wonderful place to go and explore your work. So I too would second the blog. But Joe, thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew. Be well. That was my conversation with the wonderful Joe McNally. A huge, huge thank you to Joe, as always, for taking the time to speak with me. And I hope you enjoyed listening to that wonderful man as much as I enjoyed speaking with him. If you did and you like what you're hearing on the Standout Photography Show, please support the show with your words, not your wallets. It takes less than 60 seconds to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, but it does make a huge difference in securing the very finest photographers in the world, like Joe, with very busy schedules. Also, if there is someone that you would like to hear on the Standout Photography Show, please do let me know over on the Twittergrams at Matthew D. A. Walker. For now, thank you as always for spending a small portion of your day with me. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've been Matthew Walker. He has been Joe McNally. And you, you have been sensational. Until next time, take care.